بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين السلام عليكم brothers and sisters and welcome to another episode of the life of Prophet Muhammad in our last episode we walked through some of the most tragic events in the Prophet's early life we mentioned that at the age of about six he loses his mother Two years after, at the age of eight, he loses his grandfather, his paternal grandfather, Abdul Muttalib. And after the, the demise of Abdul Muttalib, upon the request of Abdul Muttalib, he was given to Abu Talib. And Abu Talib <clears throat> essentially becomes the guardian of the Prophet and he treated him like his own son he cared for him and he he cared for him and loved him even more than his own children when he would travel travel on his trading expeditions to Syria the young Muhammad would accompany him and there were occasions where certain scholars of, of different faith backgrounds Christian monks would recognize unique qualities about this young boy and they would tell Abu Talib that this young boy has a bright future this young boy is the promised messenger make sure that you keep him close to you make sure you look after him make sure you protect him and <clears throat> you see that Abu Talib kept a very close eye on the young Muhammad partly because he was his nephew he was you know the son of the most beloved child of Abdul Muttalib but he also had the knowledge that this young boy would be a leader that he would take the Arabs out of the darkness of ignorance into the light of wisdom and enlightenment now, in addition to <clears throat> the care that the Prophet ﷺ enjoyed under the guardianship of Abu Talib, there was a divine hand that was caring and protecting the Prophet and guiding him towards a life of virtue. We have a very beautiful statement from Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib in Nahj al balagha in Sermon 192, where the Imam السلام, shares with us the divine care that the Prophet enjoyed long before the commencement of his prophetic mission. And this shows you that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ensures that his prophets and his messengers preserve a stellar reputation among the people so they give they don't give any excuse to the people that they were sent to guide to question their nobility or their integrity imam amir al mu'minin in sermon 192 of nahj al balagha he speaks about the prophet and he says walaqad qarana allah ta'ala bihi sallallahu alayhi wa ali min ladun and كان فطيما أعظم ملك من ملائكته يسلك به طريق المكارم ومحاسن أخلاق العالم ليله ونهارا. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib he says about the Prophet from the time he was weaned, meaning from the time that he was, you know, being nursed. As a, as, a, as a child from the time he was weaned God sent the greatest of his angels to accompany him and lead him day and night down a path to nobility and virtue now we know that all human beings are born with angels who are assigned to them to protect them to 
to function as scribes to record their deeds. But the Prophet ﷺ, in addition to the angels that were that are provided to each human being, Amir al Mu'mineen, he says that God sent the greatest of his angels to accompany him. The Imam says, وَلَقَدْ قَرَنَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى Meaning that this angel, the greatest of angels, and it doesn't mention who it is, whether it's Jibra'il or another angel that we're not, we don't know about. This angel was the Prophet's qareen from the days that he was a, a child, from when he was weaned, until he began his prophetic mission. This supreme angel accompanied the Prophet and was with him day and night and would inspire his heart, would lead him down a path to nobility and virtue. Now, of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is teaching and enlightening and training the Prophet, but he's doing it through the, the medium of this angel. You know, and this is what we read in, uh, in the Quran where, you know, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he speaks about this idea of, you know, how he taught, he taught man. And some mufassireen say that, you know, that, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi was the main and the primary student of God. You know, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, in one tradition, he says, Adabani Rabbi, that my Lord disciplined me, he trained me. So this could be an allusion to that divine training that he received from the day that he was weaned until uh, he begins his prophetic mission. So when we think about the Prophet, when we think about the biography of the Prophet, many Muslims have the impression that he was he came in contact with the angelic world when he was in the cave of Hira at the age of 40. That was his first encounter. But you find that Amir al-Mu'mineen indicates here that there were, the greatest of God's angels accompanied him from the day that he was weaned and would be with him day and night. Now whether he could see him or not, that's a different story. We don't know, but we know that the Imam salam here clearly says that God sent the greatest of his angels to accompany him and lead him day and night down a path to nobility and virtue. Now even in the Sunni tradition, there is a reference to this phenomenon. This, this, you know, the Prophet being guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to avoid anything that would question his character. Even, even if it wasn't something that was forbidden by divine law, if it was socially looked down upon, the Prophet ﷺ was protected from that type of behavior. In the seerah of Ibn Hisham, on page 188, there is a statement by the Prophet ﷺ where he, he reminisces uh, about his childhood. He says, I found myself among some boys from Quraysh. So the Prophet was you know, a young boy, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13 years old maybe. He says, I found myself among some boys from Quraysh. We were moving rocks around to play with them. You know, at that time, uh, you know, kids would play with rocks. You know, today they have laptops and, and iPads. And in any case, we were moving rocks around to play with them. I was also playing with them. We decided to take our clothes off to remove our shirts. So obviously it's not talking about complete completely removing your clothes, but they took their, their shirts off. And the Prophet says, we decided to take our clothes off and use them to hang the rocks over our shoulders. When I, wa when I went to take my clothes off, something struck my hand and then said, keep your clothes on. I could not see it. So according to this report, the Prophet ﷺ was not able to see uh, this angel that uh, that was accompanying him day and night. I could not see it, but I did as it told me. From then on, I carried the rocks against my neck with my friends and left my clothes on. 
So again, you see how the Prophet's dignity is preserved at every phase in his life, where something as simple as removing your shirt, even though there's nothing against the Sharia uh, that's being, there's, there's nothing sinful that's being done, but even if something is considered to be, you know, socially inappropriate, Allah protects him from engaging in that type of behavior. So you see how, how important it is for a prophet to have a stellar reputation. Because we don't, we, the, Allah doesn't want, He doesn't want people to have any excuse to not take guidance from this person. So, so the Prophet ﷺ has to preserve this, uh, this immaculate and impeccable uh, reputation. So that's a little bit about the, the Prophet's uh, early childhood. Now, another important uh, event in the Prophet's early life uh, that really dominated the Arabian Peninsula for a good portion of the Prophet's youth, uh, it was known as the Sac Religious Wars, Harbul Fijar. Some pronounce it as Harbul Fujar, but the more accurate pronunciation is Harbul Fijar, the Sac religious wars. So, in, so the Prophet's youth uh, was uh, was during this time of war and bloodshed. Now, Harbul Fijar was a reference to four. You know, if you want to call it wars or military conflicts or skirmishes, there was a fight that broke out between the tribes. And the four wars were between the tribes of Hawazin, of Quraysh, and Kinana. So you have these super tribes who are in conflict. So you can imagine that the entire region is set ablaze because of uh, of this conflict now the reason why these wars were called the sacrilegious wars was because they took place in the sacred months you know even in the pre-islamic era the arabs held certain months in high reverence they considered them to be sacred months and the four months because the sacred months are four in number the sacred months refer to the month of the Qa'da, the Hijjah, uh, Rajab, and Muharram. So, unfortunately, these wars were happening in during the sacred months, and therefore, even by pre-Islamic standards, these wars were an egregious violation of the Jahili moral code. Now the reason why this is relevant to the, the Prophet's biography is because there's a debate amongst scholars over whether or not Abu Talib and the Prophet participated in the fourth war because Harbul Fijar is basically a reference to four battles or four wars so there's a debate whether the Abu Talib and the Prophet participated in, in uh, participated in the fourth uh, skirmish. Now, if there is evidence that the Prophet and Abu Talib participated, we have to concede that they must have been justified in doing so. You know, sometimes uh, you're compelled. To, to fight during the sacred months. You know, an example is Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Imam al Hussein did not want to, you know, uh, fight in the month of Muharram, but he had to uh, because of self defense. So if Abu Talib and the Prophet participated in these sacrilegious wars, they must have had a moral justification. And this is the, the dominant Sunni view. The dominant Sunni opinion is that. When the Prophet was a youth, when he was young, uh, him and Abu Talib did in fact participate in these in the fourth 
sacrilegious war. And this is where the Prophet actually demonstrated his courage and his valor. Now, according to Shi'i historians, you know, the, the likes of uh, Sayyid uh, Ja'far Murtal al-Amini, who, who, fam- who, was, who passed away just uh, last year, he compiled, he wrote uh, a, a critical analysis of the Prophet's biography, because there's a, lo- a lot has been written about the life of the Prophet, and he took it upon himself to analyze the reports on the seerah and pr- come up with, you know, an authentic rendition of the Prophet's uh, life. So according to his analysis and according to many Shia historians, there is a very strong possibility that the reports that mention that Abu Talib and the Prophet participated in the sacrilegious wars was actually a fabrication. And what was the motivation? You know, why would why would anyone fabricate something like that? You know, this is before the advent of Islam. Why why is there why would such a report be, even be fabricated? Now, it seems that this is one of the examples of the Umayyads trying to distort history in a way that exonerates their ancestors and uh, portrays the Prophet and Abu Talib in a uh, in a negative light. And the reason why we say this is because according to Tarikh al Yaqubi, he reports, and again, this is a Sunni historian, he narrates one report where Harb where how that, that, that basically Harb ibn Umayyah, who is the father of Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan is an Umayyad, his father is an Umayyad. So Harb ibn Umayyah, the father of Abu Sufyan, who was the arch enemy of the Prophet. Harb ibn Umayyah was the commander of the combined forces of Quraysh and Kinana. So we have reports that mention that the father of Abu Sufyan was a military commander in the sacrilegious wars. And there are other reports that mention that no, the father of Abu Sufyan, Harb ibn Umayyah, didn't participate in those battles. We have reports where in Ya'qubi, in Tariq al-Ya'qubi, where Abu Talib actually explicitly condemns the war. And Ya'qubi narrates, وَقَدْ رُوِيَ أَنَّ أَبَا طَالِبْ مَنَعَ أَنْ يَكُونَ فِيهَا It's narrated that Abu Talib uh, prohibited anyone from his family or his clan from participating. وَقَدْ رُوِيَ أَنَّ أَبَا طَالِبْ مَنَعَ أَنْ يَكُونَ فِيهَا أَحَدٌ مِنْ بَنِي هَاشِمْ وَقَالْ هَذَا ظُلْمٌ وَعُدْوَانٌ وَقَطِيعَةُ رَحْمٍ وَاسْتِحْلَالٍ لِلشَّهْرِ الْحَرَامِ Abu Talib was very vocal in his opposition to the sacrilegious wars, saying that this is an act of oppression, it's an act of transgression, it's a severing of kinship, because we're all related in some way. We're fighting against each other and shedding blood, and a violation of the sacred month. I, nor any member of my family, I, so no no one, not me or nor anyone in my family, will attend and participate in these battles. So now we have conflicting narrations. We have some narrations that mention that Abu Talib and the Prophet participated, and others say that he didn't. And we have narrations that say Abu Sufyan's father participated, and others say that he didn't. And this is why we are compelled, in the opinion of many Shi'i scholars, is that the Umayyads tried to cast doubt on their ancestors' participation while insinuating that Ali's ancestors and Imam Hussein's ancestor did participate and that even the Prophet participated. And why is this important? Because it makes the murder of Imam Hussein in Muharram look, you know, less egregious. Because, yes, Yazid fought Imam Hussein in the month of Muharram, which is one of the sacred months. But that's not that bad because even the Prophet fought 
in the sacri sacrilegious wars, and he also fought and uh, and violated the uh, the uh, the sanctity of the of the sacred months. So it's highly likely that the Umayyads try to rewrite history to say that oh, the father of Abu Sufyan did not participate in the sacrilegious wars, while Abu Talib and the Prophet did. And this, of course, makes their actions in Muharram in the year 61 after the Hijrah with the killing of Imam Hussein in the month of Muharram. It makes it more uh, pal palatable. Now, when we speak about the sacrilegious wars, it's important to keep in mind that initially Quraysh was not involved. You know, the dispute was between the Hawazin and Kinana tribes. They were not directly involved, but because of pre-existing uh, inter-tribal alliances, uh, Quraysh, uh, they were forced to join. And the war actually lasted for several years. You know, that's the thing with war. It drags on and on. And Harb al-Fijar, the sacrilegious wars, was yet another example of the endless cycle of retaliation in Arabia. You know, that's the problem when you have a culture that is predicated on this principle of retaliation. You attack me, I attack you with, with more force. And then you retaliate against me with even more violence. And then you, you can see how that just becomes a vicious, unending cycle. So these wars were costly. The, the costs were high. And it was becoming increasingly apparent to the Arabs that unlike the surrounding empires, they had no regulated system of justice. So the sacrilegious wars really brought into focus the problem of not having a, uh, a sustainable uh, legal system in Arabia. Now, shortly after Harb al-Fijar, there was an incident that took place where a visiting Yemeni merchant from the tribe of Zabid, he, he comes to Mecca. And as we mentioned, people would uh, visit Mecca because it was uh, a pilgrimage destination. It was also a commercial business hub. So this Yemeni merchant arrives in Medina to sell merchandise, to sell goods. And the infamous Al-As ibn Wa'il. Al-As ibn Wa'il should be a familiar name. He is the man whose insults against the Prophet triggered the revelation of Surah Al-Kawthar. This is the man who called the Prophet Abtar after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam lost his, uh, his sons and he had no male heirs. And it was an Asa bin Wa'il who said that, you know, you have no one who's going to carry on your name and you, your name will die with your death. And then Allah reveals Surah Al-Kawthar. And also, incidentally, another fun fact is that this is the father of Amr ibn al-As, another infamous personality in the history of Islam who was the right-hand man of Muawiyah. So this... Yemeni merchant arrives in Mecca. He has merchandise, he has goods, and he sells some of his goods to Al Asa bin Wa'il on credit. Meaning that you can take the merchandise, we've agreed on a price, and you pay me at, uh, at, a, at the next day, for example. Now, when the man returned to collect payment from Al As ibn Wa'il, he refused to pay the man because he doesn't come from a prominent tribe. And Al-As bin Wa'il is from Quraysh. So this is an example of taking advantage, exploiting someone who doesn't have the resources to hold you accountable. You know, and how, subhanAllah, how history always repeats itself. We see examples of this all around the world. There are many people who are in the situation of this Yemeni merchant who comes from a place of weakness and is taken advantage of by, uh, by those who have power and wealth. 
So this visiting merchant, again, he had no legal recourse. Now, this is the problem with 7th century Arabia. There is no legal system. If you come from a weak tribe, you know, you, don't, you can't do anything about it. So alone and helpless, you know, he basically loses, you know, everything that he has. His merchandise was, he was robbed in broad daylight. So alone and helpless, he publicly challenged the Quraysh. You know, and some narrations say that he went in front of, uh, he went to uh, Jabal Abi Qubais and he cried out and, uh, and was pleading for someone to help him. Now, the Prophet's uncle, Zubair ibn Abdul Muttalib, he heard the merchants cry and he decided that he would meet with the chiefs of Quraysh to try to resolve this problem. Because even from a business standpoint, you don't want people to, to see Mecca as a place where you can get robbed. Right? You know, because crime is also, in addition to it being you know, uh, an issue of, of ethics and morality. You know, crime is also bad for business. So there was a man by the name of Abdullah ibn Jud'an who is from the clan of Taim. It's a clan within the tribe of Quraysh. And this man, a noble man, who, he took it upon himself to call a meeting, to call an open meeting at his house to address the complaint and develop a code of justice. So this is this is where you see people taking initiative. There's a problem instead of handing off the problem to someone else or just saying that it's someone else's issue. Abdullah ibn Jud'an takes it on upon himself to call upon the chiefs of Quraysh to have a meeting and to come up with some code of justice. We need to have some laws in Mecca. Now Unfortunately, only five of the 14 Quraysh clans accepted Abdullah's invitation. The rest just couldn't be bothered, right? Now, the parties who did participate in this meeting were, of course, Banu Hashim. And you see that Bani Hashim, they're always at the forefront when it comes to nobility and honor and serving people and, and doing what's right standing up for the oppressed. So Banu Hashim, Banu Muttalib, Banu Asad, Banu Zuhra, and Banu Taim are the, are the five clans within Quraysh who come together. And the attendees agreed to a simple code of ethics. They did not draft a complicated legal document. In very plain language, they basically came to an agreement that collectively they would stand for the oppressed against the oppressor, irrespective of who the Zalim is. So they're not going to turn a blind eye just because the oppressor happens to come from a prominent clan. So all of the parties, they submerged their hands in Zemzem, and they took a vow, they made an oath, they swore to help anyone who is wrong who was wronged against him, who has wronged him. And the Prophet ﷺ was an attendee. So he was probably at the age of 20, and the Prophet ﷺ attended this meeting, and he was one of the founders of this organization, known as Hilf al-Fudul, which essentially was a coalition of justice. And this organization, so this kind of gives you a glimpse into the Prophet's uh, political and social activism before the advent of Islam. Now, even after the advent of Islam, the Prophet ﷺ famously uh, recalls the, the Hilf al fudul and he says, لَقَدْ شَهِدْتُ فِي دَارِ عَبْدِ اللَّهِ بْنِ جُدْعَانِ حلفا ما أحب أن لي به حمر النعم ولو أدعى به في الإسلام لأجبت. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وآله he says, you know, looking back at those times at his own youth, 
He says, I witnessed, meaning I was there, I was an attendee. I witnessed a pact in the house of Abdullah ibn Jud'an. It was more appealing to me than herds of cattle. You know, Humr al-Ni'am is, is Humr al-Ni'am are basically a reference to, you know, cam, a herd of camels or herd of cattle. It's the equivalent of saying that this, being a part of this organization is more beloved to me than owning a fleet of luxury cars, is how we can translate it in, in modern language to make it more understandable. And then the Prophet says, even now, in the period of Islam, I would respond positively to attending such a meeting if I were invited. So this shows you that the Prophet ﷺ had no qualms working hand in hand with mushrikeen if it meant that we're going to achieve something that is of a greater good. That we can, if we can work together to eliminate injustice, the Prophet ﷺ was willing to work with people of different uh, religious backgrounds. And this just shows you uh, Islam's vision for establishing justice. You know, as long as you stand for justice, Islam will support you and will back you. Now, what's interesting is that uh, this Hilf al Fulul, it was called the Fulul Pact because the, you know the founders, uh, many of them, their their first names were uh, were uh, derivations of uh, of uh, Fadl. So you know, they're, 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 because their names began were Fadl, it was called Fulul, which is the uh, the plural. Now this. Uh, Fulul Pact, this organization that advocated for oppressed people in Arabia, you know, remained in the collective memory of the Arabs to such an extent that when there was a dispute many years after the Prophet Sallallahu death, there was a dispute between Imam al Hussein. And Al Walid ibn Utba, you know, who's the, the grandson of Abu Sufyan. And Al Walid essentially confiscated land that belonged to Imam al Hussein. He occupied, you know, the, the Imam al Hussein's land. So Imam al Hussein, alayhi salam, of course, the Imam is not a pacifist. The Imam is not going to just roll over when someone takes advantage of him. The Imam, he says to Al Walid, I swear to God, if you do not give me what is my right, I shall draw my sword, stand in the masjid of Rasulullah, and invoke the Fulul Pact. So this shows us that Hilf al Fulul existed in some form even during the time of Imam al Hussein. So this is an organization that endured and uh, survived the test of time and of course maybe there were some changes that took place but uh, the, the the Fulul Pact still meant something to people and again the Prophet Sallallahu was one of the the founders of Hilf al-Fulul and, uh, and not, another thing that's important to mention is that the Prophet wasn't the president of the organization right he was a member and this shows you that you don't always need to be the head of an organization. You know, sometimes you have to be humble and you're an attendee and you're you're a member. So this shows us that the Prophet ﷺ had so much humility that even though he's the most qualified, you know, even in his 20s, he was the most qualified, yet he was satisfied and content with being an attendee and a member of that organization. Now, among the so going back to the story of Imam al Hussein. Among those who were present when Imam Hussein made that statement, Abdullah ibn, Z Abdullah ibn Zubayr and a man from Zuhra and Taim, they all pledged to answer his call. So when Imam Hussein threatened Al Walid that I'm going to invoke Hilf al Fulul, there were there were people who were affiliated with that organization who uh, were willing to support Imam Hussein. And when Al Walid saw the backlash, he uh, gave Imam al Hussein uh, what was rightfully his. Now, another thing that we want to speak about before we actually uh, transition to 
the discussion about how the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Wasallam met Khadija, which will be discussed uh, in uh, in our upcoming episodes. When it's, when we when we speak about the Prophet's youth, what was the Prophet doing? What was his profession? Now, when you look at the the dominant view among Sunni historians who 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 specialize in the seerah, they said that he was a shepherd. The Prophet ﷺ was a shepherd. However, when you when you look through Shia sources, you we, we don't see any evidence of this in the words of the Ahlul Bayt. Now Abu Huraira claims that the Prophet said, and this is a narration that's mentioned in Bukhari, where the Prophet allegedly said, "Ma ba'ath Allahu nabiyan illa ra'a al-ghanam." God sent no prophet who was not a shepherd. قال أصحابه وأنت. So the companions of the Prophet said, "Ya Rasulullah." Were you also a shepherd? Meaning, was this also your occupation? فَقَالَ نَعَمْ كُنْتُ أَرْعَاهَا عَلَىٰ قَرَارِيطٍ لِأَهْلِ مَكَّةٍ So when he was asked if this applied to him too, the Prophet said, Yes, I used to herd sheep at Qaratiyat, which is a place for the people of Mecca. So Abu Huraira claims that the Prophet was employed by people in Mecca to, to herd their sheep. Now, in Shi'i traditions, we have narrations that mention from Imam al-Sadiq that, that allude to the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not ever send a prophet unless he charged them with the care of sheep and cattle. For example, Imam al-Sadiq, he says, مَا بَعَثَ اللَّهُ نَبِيًّا قط. حَتَّى يَسْتَرْعِيهِ الْغَنَمْ يُعَلِّمُهُ بِذَلِكَ رَعِيَّةَ النَّاسِ Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, he says, God sent no prophet without first charging him with the care of sheep, thereby teaching him to care for people. And in the same way that it takes a lot of patience to care for sheep, it also takes a lot of patience when you want to teach people. You have to be a person of patience. You have to be gentle. You have to strike a balance between assertiveness and gentleness. So there are a lot of important qualities that can be fostered and developed when someone uh, is in this, uh, when someone has to take care of uh, sheep. In another hadith from Imam al-Sadiq, he says, "In Allah jaala arzaq anbiyaihi fi zarr, wa dar li alla yakra hu shayan min qatr al-sama." It's a very beautiful hadith from the Imam where he says, "God placed the sustenance of prophets in farming and in milking cattle, so that they never begrudge the rain." You know, when you're not a when you're a farmer. You never say that, oh my God, I can't believe it's raining today. I hate the rain. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put the rizq of prophets in professions that depend on rain. And therefore, they had, had this natural... So most people don't like it when it rains. You know, They get bothered by the rain. But prophets, because of the professions that Allah put them in, because He put their sustenance in farming and in milking cattle, they never uh, begrudged uh, the rain. So, based on these narrations, we also have a statement from Ammar ibn Yasir where he says, the Prophet was never an employee to anyone. And this is mentioned in Tariq al-Ya'qubi, volume 2, page 14. And this makes sense if you consider the Prophet's social standing. The Prophet is the grandson of Abdul Muttalib. He comes from the most prominent tribe. And for the Prophet to be an employee working for the people in Mecca, it would be beneath 
his social status. So it's it's highly unlikely that the Prophet was employed by other people. Uh, Ammar ibn Yasin himself that says the Prophet was never an employee to anyone. So when we look at these narrations, we can draw the following conclusion. And that is that we can accept that the Prophet ﷺ also herded sheep, but not, not as an employee of others, as implied by Abu Hurairah. Because Abu Hurairah implies that the Prophet was an employee, he was hired by the people of Mecca. But according to the Shi'i perspective, according to many Shi'i historians, that is not something that would be uh, suitable for the prophets it, it, it would it wouldn't be plausible considering his social status and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not want his prophet to be subordinate to others in that way especially to uh, to mushrikeen whereas in the Shia tradition there is a lot of emphasis on the fact that the prophet's main source of income was he was a merchant you know he would travel he learned the, the trade from uh, his uncle uh, Abu Talib. He accompanied him on trading expeditions and he learned that skill. So the Prophet, yes, he herded sheep, but he was not an employee of others. And we'll see, inshallah, in our upcoming episodes how the Prophet's, uh, how his integrity and his business savviness actually. Uh, attracts the attention of the most prominent uh, bachelorette in uh, in Arabia, the uh, none other than Khadija alayhi salam. But for that, we'll sh inshallah we'll leave that for our upcoming episodes. Thank you so much, brothers and sisters, for lending me your ears, and I look forward to having you join me on another episode of the life of Prophet Muhammad. Thank you so much for tuning in. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad ajjil fajr. Okay, any questions or comments? There's a question of why were the months bef uh, sacred before Islam? Why were the sacred months sacred? Why were the sacred months sacred? You know, off the top of my head, I don't know exactly why those particular months. I mean, uh, the the Hijjah is understandable because of of Hajj, but the others, I I would have to look at if look to see if there are any ahadith uh, that specifically identify a reason. Off the top of my head, I don't know. I know that this is something that existed during the time of Jahiliyyah and it was endorsed by the uh, by the Quran. But the specific reasons why those particular months were designated as al Ashur al Hurum, I, I'm not sure. If you can remind me, uh, Brother Zain, I can I can look up the answer to see if we have any ahadith. But off of the top of my head, I don't recall any any specific traditions. Uh, so it sounds like there's only a doubt about the last of the four skirmishes. There's like everyone agrees that the prophet did not participate in the first three. Is that correct? So yeah, so th th there's there's an agreement that the prophet did not uh, participate in the the first three, most likely because Quraysh wasn't they were they weren't really involved in the first the, the first uh, three because as we mentioned that they were kind of dragged into the the sacrilegious wars because of the uh, the intertribal alliances. So the fourth is where the discussion is about because this, that's when uh, Quraysh was actually uh, forced to kind of get involved. Could you talk a little bit about those wars? Like what uh, instigated those wars? Uh, why they went on for so long? You know, it's, it's funny that you asked me. I, I was actually going to read about it, but I... <laughs> I thought that probably no one's going to ask and it's probably irrelevant, but uh, I don't know exactly what it was. You know, most of these wars, unfortunately, if you look at them, they're often uh, triggered because, you know, someone's, you know, someone uh, has a fragile ego, 
you know. So I, I would have to look look that up. I don't I don't know exactly what triggered those wars, but oftentimes they're, they're very silly. It's it's an issue of you know this person attacked me and I'm going to attack them. But uh, if if I knew someone was going to ask this question, I would have read up on it. But uh, I kind of just glossed over uh, that material. So now you have two questions uh, for me to answer this week for you guys. Yeah, I mean, we, de we what we know is just from the history of of these uh, these wars. A lot of these conflicts were based on the most trivial, the most ridiculous, and frivolous of issues. So I I, I don't doubt that this uh, that this was something uh, that's that that's the same. So it was sacrilegious because of the timing of the battles of these wars. And also the nature that what, what drove people to violence was also something that was definitely not worth it. Definitely trivial. Uh, and there's a question that uh, someone's asking. I have read that some children also used to wear amulets around their necks, but the prophet had no such thing to protect him. Uh, is that an accurate statement or as far as you know? It's, it's, I mean, when it comes to accurate, we, I can't comment on whether we know that for, for certain, but it's plausible that, that in a polytheistic culture, you will see, you know, people uh, engage in that type of practice where they, you know, they wear certain things to, to give them protection, but the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, being a staunch monotheist, uh, his, uh, his reliance was uh, on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for protection. So that's, that's, a, that's very plausible that that type of thing uh, was happening in the Jahili culture. Uh, there's a question of, uh, uh, from what I understood, Imam Ali used to work for a Jew. Uh, is that correct or not? So we, when we say that Imam Ali alayhi salam used to work for a Jew, there, there's a difference between being employed now with the prophet we we have what we believe is evidence that he was an employee to anyone now with imam ali ibn abi talib when we say that he he worked for a jew there there's a certain contract in islamic law known as muzara where someone owns the land you cultivate it for them and you share the crops so that's not the same as being an ajil being an employee so you know amir al-mu'minin for instance would you know, cultivate land that belonged to a Jew, but the imam wasn't an, an employee in the sense that, you know, he was getting paid an hourly wage. It was almost like a partnership where the imam would cultivate the land and he would have a share of, uh, of, the, uh, of what it would produce. So it's a type of partnership, an agricultural partnership. A profit sharing agreement almost. Exactly, exactly. And we'll speak a little bit about more, a little more about this when we, when we discuss the nature of the prophet's contract with uh, with Khadija, you know, because there's also a discussion about was was the prophet an employee of Khadija, or was it a business partnership? Was it Muvaraba? And so we'll I'll, we'll leave that for uh, that discussion when we speak about uh, his his business trip. Uh, him taking charge of uh, Khadija's caravan. So uh, talked about the prophet having uh, being a shepherd and also having these business trips. Were those these two different stages of his life, or would they have been happening kind of at the same time? I mean, we know that at least at least twice the prophet sallallahu alaihi accompanied uh, Abu Talib. We don't know if he went on his own. Chances are he didn't because. Abu Talib was very protective over his uh, his nephew, but you have to also remember that the when we say these trading expeditions, these trading expeditions would take several months, and uh, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa I'm sure uh, benefited greatly uh, from that experience. So, you know, in his so definitely in his twenties. We see that uh, so in his in his youth in his youth and in his twenties it seems that uh, he would have uh, he would have you know made some of these uh, trips. Now again we mentioned that he he went with his uh, 
with his uncle uh, Abu Talib when he was 12. So we don't know exactly how many trips, but I believe that there were two, two trips with, uh, with, with his uncle. Whether there were more or not, I, I'm not sure. I would, I would have to check. And, and would those trips not count as uh, being an employee of his uncle? No, because he, he was he was assisting his uncle. He wasn't an employee of his uncle. He was uh, Abu Talib never employed uh, his nephew. It's I mean it's basically like helping with with the family business. Thank you. And uh, another question: Has business been encouraged by the Prophet? Absolutely. In fact, uh, I'll I'll share some ahadith about uh, about the. Uh, how, how much the Islamic tradition recommends and encourages people to be self-employed in the sense that, you know, you, you, you buy and sell yourself, you know, why, why work for someone else when you can be your own boss? It's better to employ others than to, than to work as an employee for someone. So to, to buy and sell, you know, tijara commerce is, uh, is one of the most noble, uh, professions and careers in the uh, in the Islamic tradition. Absolutely. And I'll be sharing some ahadith uh, about that. Oh, that. That would be really interesting. Inshallah. Well, uh, thank you very much, Sheikh. Zakamallah. Thank you so much again for organizing this. May Allah bless you and, uh, you know, may he allow us to, to benefit from the light, the nur of uh, the prophetic uh, biography. I look forward to continuing our discussion uh next week it's hard to believe that we're already we finished nine episodes and now we're on uh we'll be on episode uh 10 so i would say that we're about 10 percent done with uh, with the prophet's biography i think that we'll be it'll likely be over a hundred and uh, i'm excited about having uh having you guys join me on this this kind of this intellectual journey <laughs>